Good morning. How are y'all doing? Man, are y'all excited to be here? Are you guys awake? I mean, some of you are, right? Well, we're excited. Uh, we're excited for you guys that are joining us online this morning, uh, just being a part of it. We've uh, changed some things up, and we're doing our live stream a little earlier uh, from now on because I like this crowd, too. Uh, and so we haven't really got to spend a lot of time where people get to see this side of the church. And so uh, we wanted people to see that. And so we're excited uh, just to kind of start streaming now and uh, get that morning going and get us excited and everything else. And so uh, the second group was always great about making and shouting and being loud, so y'all are going to have to live up to that expectation uh, this morning as we go into that, because people are listening to see if there's anybody in here with me. Um, and uh, there we go. We're not alone, so that's good. Uh, we are excited. I'm excited. It's been a few weeks since I've been able to be up here uh, sharing the Word and preaching the Word, and I was talking uh, last week to Margaret as we uh, kind of got ready and everything else, and she was like, I'm a little nervous to get up here and talk, and I said, that's okay. I am always nervous, and she said, no, you're not. I said, yeah, absolutely. Every single time that I get up here, I'm a little nervous because uh, my wife is in the audience, and who knows what I'm going to say, uh, and uh, so the reality is is that sometimes I say things that I shouldn't say, uh, so hopefully God will, in grace, uh, not let you hear those things, uh, and in his grace, he will make sure that you hear the things that you absolutely need to. Uh, I'm excited because we're going to start a new series. I've been praying a lot this year, uh, looking at how we as a church can grow, not just uh, grow bigger in numbers, but really grow in our relationship with God as we can uh, walk uh, further and closer with Him. And so we're going to start a series uh, this week, and we're going to go for a little while uh, looking at how we can walk worthy. And what that really means, I'm going to kind of unpack today and look at a little bit, and then we're going to dive into a little bit of the book of Ruth and uh, begin our journey as we walk worthy with God and everything else. But following God and living out His will for our lives is the most rewarding, right? It's the most uh, life-giving, hope-filled, exciting, powerful, best decision that we will ever make in our lives, Right? That, that decision to follow Christ, that decision to give our life to him and live for his glory, to accept the grace that he has for us, to fall in love with the one who loves us so much that he gave his life for us, right? That's an exciting thing. But as we learned a few weeks ago, that's also at times what a difficult thing, right? It ain't easy, right? It's not easy always to follow God, to trust in him, uh, to, to give our entire life to him. Listen to the words in Matthew Matthew chapter 16, uh, starting in uh, verse 24, Jesus says this to his disciples. He says, whoever wants to be my disciples must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what? Can anyone give in exchange for their soul? As we learned last week, or a few weeks ago, when uh, the calling of Moses, simple obedience isn't always simple, right? Trusting God, following him, uh, answering his call, surrendering our life, giving everything to him. It's not always that simple, right? There are things that we bring into the relationship, right? There's baggage that we bring in uh, to our relationship with God. The beauty of that is God takes our baggage on him and he cleanses of us of it, right? He takes it and he washes it away. But the reality is we still struggle. We still have a fight. There's still a battle as um, Pastor Zach shared with us a couple weeks ago. There's this war that we're in the midst of and we as followers of Christ are actually in the fight of our lives. And that's why he shared that we should put on the full armor of God. But I want you to make no mistake about it. If you are not a follower of God, you're still in a war. You're still in a battle. You're still in a fight for your life. The problem is you don't have the hope. See, we know that the hope is Jesus Christ. We know that he is the way, the truth, and the life. And he's the only thing that's going to get us through this world. But also, he's the only thing that's going to get us through eternity, right? Through every aspect. The reality is that we too can know the hope that those who follow Christ, who trust in him, who cling to him can have. See, we can know Christ and the true power of his resurrection. How do we know it? How do we uh, receive this hope? 
How do we face what appears at times to be insurmountable odds, right? We can look at our lives and we can think there's no way that we're going to get through this. There's no way that we're going to be able to handle this. Reagan and I kind of had one of those small moments, not a big moment, but a small moment this last week as we started really realizing that our daughters are seniors this year. Now, that's a big odd, right? That's a big thing. And, and we were just kind of thinking about it. We were watching uh, our friends, and I was uh, talking to one of my really good friends last night whose daughter uh, recently graduated, and he's like, I didn't think I was going to make it. And then he looked at me, and he goes, and I don't know how you're going to. And I thought to myself, I'm like, thanks. Thanks for believing in me. You know, he was telling me that right before all of us came over to the house, they had a little bit of a breakdown where they both just kind of cried a little bit and died inside. And I was like, this excites me. <laughs> but, but here's the reality. If we look at our life, there are moments like that, right? There are moments of intense joy and where we get excited and we find life and hope. But there are also moments of tragedy and struggle and hardship where we don't know where to turn. But the beauty is that if we turn to God, he is always faithful. You see, we must understand that there's nothing that we can do in and of ourselves to save ourselves. Therefore, we must throw our lives, throw our lives before the mercy of the cross, right? And I don't mean just kind of place it down. No, we have to throw our lives down there, giving it all. Saying, God, I can't do this. I can't make it. I am absolutely nothing without you. And your grace. And the beauty is that when we accept the gift of God through Jesus Christ, when we accept that gift of him giving his life for us at just the right time, when we are powerless to do so, Christ steps into our life and he what? He saves us. Now the beauty of that is that we are continuously being saved, right? It's not just like this one time and we're just done with everything. No, we are continuously being saved as Christ continuously begins to work in and through our lives. God's word tells us that all of sin and fall short of the glory of God and that sin separates us from a right relationship with God. The cost of sin is what? Death every single time. But not simply death in this world. You see, the worst death that we will ever face is in the sense that one day, if we are not in Christ Jesus, we will be completely separated from God. We will have no hope. But the beauty is that God loved us so much that he sent his son so that we would never have to face that reality. You see, we must believe in the finished work of the cross, the burial, and the resurrection. Christ then sets us free from our sin and our shame, and we are counted then as what? Sons and daughters of God. Our God no longer sees the sin. He no longer sees uh, the wrongs that we've done, but now he sees us full of life and full of hope, just as his son was full of life and full of hope. And we can walk with Christ in everlasting life. But what does it mean? We talk a lot about uh, following God, right? Living our life for the glory of God. And I think uh, a lot of times, as believers, we kind of fall into a trap, right? Once saved, I'm, I'm good. I'm, I just have to kind of coast. I can kind of do what I want to and everything else. Or maybe at times we don't really see the need to give our life completely to the Savior. But without that, we have no hope. You see, we're called to follow him, and when we follow him, what we're doing is we're living our lives for the glory of God. I like to say it this way, we walk worthy. I think that's the way Paul would say it, we walk worthy. Now, I know, I know you're probably asking yourself, what does that mean to walk worthy? Well, I know it also kind of sounds a little bit cliche, but it's exactly what we're to do if we're in Christ Jesus. Look at me real quickly. In Philippians chapter 3, Philippians chapter 3, starting in verse 7, Paul's saying this. He's saying, as we follow God, as we live for his glory, as we uh, walk worthy, whatever were gains to us, we now consider loss for Christ's sake. What is more, I consider everything loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For whose sake I have lost all things, I consider them garbage. 
that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his suffering, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I've already obtained all of this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on and take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus He goes on to say, all of us then who are mature should take such a view of things. And if on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. Only let us live up to what we have already obtained. You see, when we walk worthy, we're living our lives fully and completely in acknowledgement and acceptance of the amazing glory and power of salvation through Jesus Christ. This this power, this salvation is something if we are in Christ Jesus that we have already been given. We've already got it. Let me say it another way. Basically what it means is this, is that everything that you need, everything that that you require, everything that uh, this world is going to throw at you, you already have. Everything that you need to live for the glory of God, face the trials, endure the hardships, overcome the temptations, what you need has already been given to you in Christ Jesus. I hear a lot of believers, and I even say it too all the time, right? I just can't do this. There's no way I'm going to make it. I don't know how we're going to do this. We're just done. I just give up. I quit. I surrender. No, no. see, we've already surrendered our life to the Savior, and he came in and won the victory for us. He's our hope. He's our life. He's our everything. The same power that conquered sin in the grave in our lives, it now lives in us, as Paul would say. And then we're to live up to what we've already obtained. You see, the God of the universe, the creator of all things loves us, even in the depth of our brokenness, even uh, in, in our rebellion against him, right? He loved us so much that he gave his one and only son to die in our place. This is the gospel. This is something that we don't just jump off into. This is something that we live in. This is something that we allow to fill every area of our life. This is the good news of Jesus Christ, and everything in our lives should grow out of this truth. Everything in our lives. How do I live in my marriage? Will you live for the glory of God who gave his life for you? How do I live raising my kids? Will you raise your kids to the glory of God who gave his life for you? How do I work where you work to the best of the glory of God because God gave his life for you? How do I face trials? How do I face death? How do I face struggle? For the glory of God, giving all that you have to him. In the amazing words of the hymn writer Isaac Watts, I love this, this hymn, it says, Here he says, see, from his head, his hands, his feet, sorrow and love flowed mingled down. Did e'er such love and sorrow meet, or thorns compose so rich a crown, were the whole realm of nature mine, that were a present far too small, love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life. My all. Basically what that means is that you can have this world. Give me Jesus. He demands our soul, our life, our all. So over the next few weeks, what we're going to do is we're going to take a deeper look in what it really means to walk worthy, right? To walk uh, in a deeper 
relationship with God, live up to what he's already given us, how he's already called us and promised us to live for his glory. We're going to count all this loss for the glory of God. We're going to trust him as we've never trusted him before. And we're going to run to him and with him, not away from him. In all circumstances, we're going to live our lives for the glory of God above all because he is worthy of all our praise. Does that excite you a little bit? I mean, it should, right? It should get you a little excited to know. But today, I want to start with this. You see, to understand what we ought to live and how we ought to live, I think we should probably take a look at how we ought not to live. Because maybe you're like me. You hear all this stuff, but I want to know, what, what's the consequence? What's the bad thing, right? right, right? Because, because I like to, at times, do the bare minimum, right? Well, I want you to know that living for the glory of God isn't about doing the bare minimum. Christ didn't do the bare minimum whenever he gave his life for us. And we shouldn't do the bare minimum when we live for his glory as well. Turn with me to Ruth, the book of Ruth in the Old Testament. It's right after the book of Judges. It's a small little book of about four chapters, but we're going to unpack this over the next few weeks and just kind of look a little bit deeper into it. But as we're there, I just want to start this morning with some prayer. We pray with me. Father God, I just come before you today. We come before you today together. God, we're excited about who you are. God, but we don't want that excitement just to be in this room. We don't want the excitement just to be evident when we sing a song. We want it to be evident in every aspect of our lives, God. God, we don't want to just walk through the doors of the church worthy of your calling and worthy of who you are. We want to walk out into the world and face the trials worthy of who you are. And our worth doesn't come from us, God. Our worth comes from what Christ did in us. The glory of Christ Jesus in us, the hope of salvation. So this morning, God, I ask you to get me out of the way, God. Get each of us out of the way. Take away the distractions, God, and let us hear from you. God, we don't need another sermon from Robbie Ashlock. God, what we need today is a word from God. We need your truth to speak to each and every one of our hearts, God. God, we want to hear what you have to say. We want to hear how you long to challenge us and pour into us. We want to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. Because that's what's going to move us to change this world for your glory. That's what's going to move us in our marriages, in our homes, in our schools, in our jobs, in our communities, in our nation, in this world, God, for your glory. It's what Christ did for us on the cross. Today, first and foremost, God, we celebrate that. And we ask you to show us how to walk worthy. In your name we pray, amen. You see, far too often we ignore God. We, at times, have what we call free will, right? We can choose to do what we want to do. Now, free will is a cool thing because sometimes you can choose the right thing, but free will is also a troubling thing because often we what? We pick the wrong thing, right? Far too often we ignore God. We argue with him. We disobey his rules. And yes, at times we even rebel against him. Left to our own devices, left to my own sinful nature, what do I do? The wrong thing every time. Paul would say it this way. I know what I ought to do. I know the good things that I ought to do. I know how I should live my life. I know what God has called me to do. But I know what I often choose is not the right thing. So knowing the good things that I should do, I look at the bad things and say, oh, that looks really good. And so I run towards them, right? And then he says, what a wretched man am I? Where's my hope? He goes on to say that it's only in Christ Jesus. And so my prayer today is that you would see that hope as we open up the story and we look at the story of Ruth and Naomi and their family. We need to understand that in the end, God will have his way, right? We have free choice, but God has his perfect will, right, that is there. And I don't understand how all that works and all that moves, but the reality is that God is really, truly in control, right? And he will get the praise that he's due. 
God is longing to do something in our lives that is beyond our wildest dreams. And I, I can't make that too evident to you today, okay? See, God does, doesn't want to work in the life of a pastor. God doesn't just want to work in the life of, of, of a worship pastor. God wants to work in the life of every single believer. Every single one of us in this room. If we are in Christ Jesus, we're a new creation. And God wants to do something amazing in and through our lives. The question is, will we allow him to? Are we going to let him? Because a lot of times we start following God and everything goes well for a while and we see who he is and what he's done and we're excited about it. But then what? Trial comes or struggle comes or hardship comes and we get distracted. We lose sight. But how do we truly walk worthy in all circumstances. I think Paul David Tripp gives us a great uh, example of walking worthy. He calls it faith, but I'm going to call it walking worthy. He says this. He says, faith is living our lives in light of what God has said. Resting in what he's already done. And entrusting our future to his care. Now, if we look at this and we look at walking and, and serving and living for God, we know that that's not easy. It's not always easy to live our lives in light of what he said, right? Because there are things that he says that at times I don't honestly don't want to do, right? I want to go my own way. I want to do my own thing. Or maybe I don't really trust him. There's also times that I don't rest in what Christ has already done because there's times where the enemy comes and whispers in my ear, you're not enough, you're not worthy, no one loves you, no one cares for you. God doesn't really have your best interest at heart. But see, we can rest in the fact that Christ gave his life for us because he loved us. And he's the same yesterday, today, and forever, and so that never changes. And there are times where giving God my future is not an easy thing. Learn that more and more with my kids, right? And trusting them to him. And trusting things that are out of my control to him. Look with me at Ruth chapter 1, starting in verse 1. It says, in the, in the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. So a man from Bethlehem in Judah, together with his wife and two sons, went for a while to live in the country of Moab. Some would say this was a sojourn, right? A small, quick trip to just kind of get away from the famine, to get away from what's going on. Kind of set the stage for you at the time. Judges was not really the best time for the nation of Israel. If you read the book of Judges, you would see that there's a lot of war, a lot of battles, a lot of struggle. Uh, one of my good friends, one of my boys, he has just been reading through the Bible and he was talking about judges and telling me how crazy it was and all the things that were going on and everything else. And let me kind of break it down for you like this. This is the, the, the definition of judges, basically. There was no king in Israel and everyone did what was right in their own eyes. There was no one in charge, okay? That king wasn't even God. There was no one that really the people were turning to and trusting in and running to, relying on, believing in, allowing to lead their lives. And so they did what was ever right in their own eyes. Much like our world today, right? Sure feels that way, doesn't it? There's a lot of unrest, a lot of struggle, a lot of hardship, a lot of wars and rumors of wars, a lot of moral decay, a lot of lawlessness, a lot of oppression, and if we're honest, a lot of godlessness. They did what was right in their own eyes. They weren't walking worthy, right? They were the chosen people. God had called them out of Egypt, right? He'd called them into this promised land and given them everything that they needed to survive and live, and they chose to not live for his glory. During this time, Israel repeatedly turned away from God. 
to the idols of the world around them. And God had to, in this moment, uh, discipline them. And so if you read the book of Judges, you'll see that what would happen is they would follow God for a little bit of time, and then they would turn and do their own thing, and God would send another nation in with the Assyrians, the Moabites, different ones in, and they would come in and they would basically punish them and discipline them. They would turn back to God and live for him for a little while, and then they'd turn right back around. And, and it's like the struggle of all of the Bible, right, is do we follow God, do we not follow God? Do we live for him, do we not live for him? This back and forth battle. But we have to understand that God disciplines and corrects those that he loves, right? He disciplines and corrects those that he loves. Hebrews 12, 7 says this, It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons and daughters. For what son or daughter is there whom their father does not discipline, right? I mean, you've all said it, right? You, you probably look at a kid and you're like, man, that kid is out of control. Their parents don't discipline them, right? We've all said it, right? We've all thought it. Most of us at times have been that kid. But the reality is that God is going to work and move in our lives to keep us on track so that we can walk worthy. But there's another truth here that we need to understand, and that's that at times there's an enemy out there, right? There's an enemy out there that's going to cause struggle and kind of cause strife and going to try to misdirect us and mislead us and come in and try to at times dissuade us by attacking us. So how do we know the difference, right? How do we know the difference between God and disciplining us and God or in the enemy attacking us, right? Isn't that a question that many of us as believers ask a lot of times? I mean, we can be of the mindset that every single thing that happens in our lives is just an attack from the enemy. Oh, that's just an attack from the enemy. Well, if we think it's all an attack from the enemy, then what do we do? We miss how God longs to work and discipline our lives. Well, we can go the other extreme. We can say, oh, this is just God punishing me. This is just God just beating me down. But then we miss what, at times, the truth and reality that we are living in God's will and following him. This is just an attack from the enemy. So how do we balance that? How do we go back and forth? How do we know that this is a trial or a hardship or an attack or a discipline? How do we know? What do we do? Well, there's, there's only thing, one thing we can do is in all circumstances, in every single thing that comes our way. We trust completely in the one who loves us. And we follow his direction. You see, we honor him with the entirety of our life. Don't get so wrapped up on, is this an attack of the enemy or, or is this God's discipline? Let's get so wrapped up in, am I following God in everything? Am I making sure that I'm living for his glory? Am I making sure that I'm trusting him? I mean, the thing is, is, is that how do we know the difference? Well, we walk worthy in all things no matter what comes our way, and God gets the glory, right? If it's a, a trial, and we get, walk in a way that's worthy of God, and we honor him, what? God gets the glory. If it's an attack from the enemy, then we walk for the glory of God in everything that we do, and God, what? Gets the glory, no matter what we face, we trust completely in the one who loves us, and we allow him to direct our path. You see, when troubles, trials, and disciplines come our way, we typically have three responses, right? Three responses, three ways that we respond. The first one is, is I think we, we ignore them, right? We just kind of go our own way. Um, you know, it's just, this is just life. It's just the way that it is. We kind of just do our own thing, right? Or we overreact, right, and we run in the opposite direction, right, and we run away from God in that moment. But I think there's a third way that we can really truly trust him is we can surrender our lives completely to God in the midst of our struggles and in the midst of our discipline, and we can learn from them. We can say, God, I don't know if this is you, and I don't know if this is the enemy, but I know that you're good. And I trust you. I'm not going to focus so much on what's bad happening to me and the heartache that's happening to me. What I'm going to focus on is that you are hope and you are life. 
and you have it all. But we know in the story, because it's during the time that really this famine that comes onto the land is a time of judgment, right? It's a time of discipline. But look at the response of this man and his family. The man's name, in verse 2, the man's name was Elimelech, and his wife's name was Naomi. The names of his two sons were Malan and Kilian. And they were Ephorites, I can't even say that word, Ephorites. They were from the tribe of Ephraim, I can say that. From Bethlehem and Judah. And they went to Moab and they lived there. Now there's something you need to understand real quick. Let me kind of break this down. For them to go into Moab was not a good thing. The Moabites, as I said a little bit earlier, were the enemy. Basically, the way that the Moabite nation came about was there was this guy named Lot who was Abraham's nephew, right? And they, at one point, kind of split ways, and Lot went and lived in an area called Sodom and Gomorrah, right? Where he wasn't living for God, he wasn't really honoring, but God decided that he wanted to, what, save him and set him free. And so God pulls him out, and he saves him. Well, as God is pulling him out and saving him, his wife turns around, she looks back, and she longingly wants to go back to that life and that lifestyle, and she turns to a pillar of assault, which is kind of a crazy story. And Lot and his family are his two daughters, they, they are free. Now, they go up into the hills, and they live up in the hills for a while, and some kind of weird things happen. They decide that they don't have husbands, so what they're going to do is they're going to get their dad drunk. And he becomes the father of their children. That's really gross. But that's where the Moabite nation came from, right? An incestuous relationship. Not only that, they absolutely didn't follow God. They made up their own gods, and they made up their own ways, and they constantly attacked and they constantly berated the people of Israel and stood against God in open rebellion. So we know, and in the story, as they ran from this famine, what did they run to? The world. They ran away from God. It says they went to Moab and they lived there. Now Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died. And she was left with her two sons, and they married, a Mo- they married Moabite women, one named Orpah and the other named Ruth. And after they had lived there for about 10 years, both Malan and Kilian also died. And Naomi was left without her sons and her husband. The ESV would say it this way, the woman was left without. She was alone. Elimelech and his family chose what many of us do when we face trials or hardships, or even at times when we face discipline, right? We run away from God. They ran away from God. They ran to the world, and they paid the price. Let me make this clear that I'm not saying that that God killed them because they disobeyed them. What I'm saying is that they suffered from a broken relationship with the only one that could save them and set them free. See, no matter how far we run from God, God still has a purpose. He's still going to work, and he's still going to move for his glory. And no matter how far we run, we're still going to face our future, our destiny, right? Ralph Waldo Emerson would say it this way. He says, the efforts we make to escape from our destiny only serve to lead us into it. In light of eternity, this is a very damning statement. You see, we walk towards, we walk with, or we walk away from God. That's the reality, right? And one of these ways leads to death every single time. When we look at this story and we see something really interesting, names in Scripture have power, right? The name Elimelech, what it really means is that God is my king, right? He was supposed to live a life that proclaimed that God was his king is everything, but sadly his life never truly lived up to that. He and Naomi left God completely out of the decision. It doesn't say here, and oftentimes, most of the time, if not all of the time, when God leads somebody, it says God led them, 
right? Here it just says they what? They left. They went. It doesn't say they prayed about it. It doesn't say they thought about it. It doesn't say anything. It says they left. And really, I don't think God would lead them to go into a place they shouldn't be, to do things they shouldn't do. They didn't follow God in a way that they were called to follow him. Not only that, they claimed that it was a short trip, but they stayed there, what, 10 years. We may claim that we're going to step a little bit into sin, or it's just a small sin, but the reality is, is once it gets its hands on us, we stay there a long time until we truly give our life back to the Savior. See, this was supposed to be a sojourn. It was supposed to be a quick trip, but it became a new way of life for them. A life away from the will and the purpose of God. And we go cold in our faith in the absence of the Father's presence, and at some point, we need to understand where we're at. Are we truly living our life for the glory of God? Are we walking in step, walking worthy of all that He has? Are we living life for our own glory? Are we living our life in sin? You see, sin is first and foremost a heart issue. Something else is taking the place of God in our lives. The majority of us look at our lives on the outside and we see, oh, I've got to fix this problem, I've got to fix this problem, I've got to fix this problem. But I think God would say first, turn inward and see where you're at. See, the problem of the heart can be many things. It can be fear. It can be comfort. It can be lust. It can be addiction. It can be uh, the love of another. It can be pride, envy, laziness, or whatever it is. But it's always, always a heart issue. We have given our heart to someone other than God. And how do we know this is the case for Elimelech and Naomi? Well, they stayed in Moab for a long time, and their sons married Moabite women, right? They were conformed and surrendered to the world around us instead of being transformed by God in his presence. And things were good for a while, but then they fell apart as they always do, right? And I think the words in verse 8 are some of the most haunting. I love how it says it in the ASV where it says, so that the woman was left without. Naomi lost everything, right? She lost her husband, she lost her sons, she lost her hope, she lost her identity. She was heartbroken and alone, or so she thought. See, even in discipline, it's easy for us to think that we're alone, right? That God doesn't care for us. The enemy would tell us in the midst of that that we're alone. And in the midst of his attacks, he's going to tell us that we're alone, right? That we don't have hope. We don't have life. But thankfully, God is always moving. And even when we don't see it, he's moving, right? Even when we don't feel it, he's moving. In really amazing ways. He's working in and through the brokenness of our shattered life. And he's going to work in and through the brokenness of Naomi's shattered life as we are going to see in the weeks to come. But she's there in this broken state and everything else. She looks up and she hears a rumor. She hears something. Look at me at verse 6. It says, When Naomi heard in Moab that the Lord had come to the aid of his people by providing food for them, she and her daughter-in-law is prepared to return home. From there. Suddenly she hears this good news, right? She notices and hears that God has shown up and blessed his people, right? He's provided food for them. I don't know if the famine had lasted this entire time. I just know that she finally got news. She finally cared enough to hear, right? About what God was doing in the lives of his people. God had blessed them, and God began to feed them, but not his prodigal child, right, in Moab. And it broke her heart. Well, she kind of looks up, and she begins to think. I, I think she wondered, what hope is there for me? 
What life is there for me? What chance is there for me to ever be restored? I have nothing here. I'm, I'm at the bottom, right? How could I ever recover from such loss? Well, in order to recover from our loss, in order to recover from our disobedience, what do we have to do? We have to turn back to the Savior. We have to repent. But that's hard to do because a lot of us have a lot of fear whenever it comes to that. A lot of sin really is, is our fears controlling our life, right? A fear that we're missing out on something or a fear uh, that, that we can't make it and so we self-medicate or we look for other ways to encourage us or a fear that God doesn't love us and so we run away from him. We have all these fears that kind of determine our direction. Fear is a powerful thing. And when we fear something, we give it power in our lives. We submit to its control. We submit to its will, its desires. When we fear the things of this world more than we fear God, we submit to their control, their will, their desires, and we face the consequences for it, right? However, if we will fear the Lord... We'll surrender our lives completely to him and trust his will. We face only his goodness and grace, right? If we don't fear God, we face the wrath. But if we fear him, we face the grace. That, that's kind of backwards, right? If we fear the things of this world, we face the wrath. If we fear the things of God, we face hope, redemption, and life. Psalm 111, 6 reminds us of this, is that God has shown his people his works, giving them the lands and other nations. The works of his hands are faithful and just, and all his laws are trustworthy. They're established forever and ever, enacted in faithfulness and righteousness. And he provided redemption for his people. He ordained his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And all who follow his laws have good understanding. God is good. Surrender your life to God before sin destroys it. Right? Give your life to the only one that can save you and set you free. It's easy for us to lose our identity when we walk away from the Lord's will for our lives. Trusting only in what we see and feel. But we have to focus and trust on God's presence even when we don't see it, even when we don't feel it. One of the greatest stories of this, I think, is the story of Jeremiah, who they call the weeping prophet, right? He faced a time, another time in Israel's history where it was just pure desolation, pure horrific acts. But even in the midst of his struggle, even in the midst of his affliction, he found hope. He knew how cold and heartless this world could be, but he also knew the goodness of God and all that God had to offer. So he rejoiced even in the darkest of circumstances. Listen to his words in Lamentations 3. He says, because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassion never fails. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Now, obviously, whatever was going on in his life threatened to consume him because he said, hey, I'm about to be consumed, but I'm not consumed because what? God is enough, and he's faithful, and he's there. Naomi, obviously, growing up in the nation of Israel, had heard the good things. She'd heard about how God had brought them out of bondage, right out of slavery into the promised land. She'd heard all of these great truths. Elimelech had heard all of these amazing things truth, but maybe they had never really truly experienced them for themselves, which is probably why they ran in the first place, which is probably why they didn't truly give their life to the Savior. And I want you to make no mistake, this is the story of a runaway, right? Someone that is too afraid to go home. Somebody that uh, feels like it's too late to save their life. Somebody that's way too far gone, way too full of shame to face. And we're going to see that as we unpack that over the next few weeks. 
But I want you to understand something through all of this. We can walk worthy. And not because of what we have done, but because of what God has done. Because of who he is. We're going to see an amazing story of Christ in the midst of Ruth and Naomi. I was talking to somebody recently, and I was like, I don't know why they don't call this book Naomi, because I feel like it's more about her. But it's really the faithfulness of Ruth that's going to shine that and show that. But I want you to see the redemptive story of Naomi in the midst of it. Someone who was broken and lost and felt no hope, who began to walk worthy. See, walking worthy is living in the promise of what God has said, resting in what he's done, and trusting our lives to his care. The question today is, will you have the faith to walk worthy, to walk into all that God has in store for you? Will you trust him with your entire life? I'm not going to sugarcoat it. It's not an easy decision to follow Christ, to live for his glory. But following and living out his will is the most rewarding, life-giving, hope-filled, exciting, and powerful decision that you will ever make. Our God is worthy. And he loved us so much that he sent his son to die on the cross in our place. Taking our sin and shame upon himself and setting us free and raising us up to a new life that we, too, can walk worthy for his glory. Will we do that today? We pray with me. Father God, we thank you for your word and your truth. And today we ask you, God, open our eyes, God. Open my eyes, God, to the things in my own life that I am not doing for your glory, God. Break my heart today, God. Break our heart today for the things that break your heart. Show us today, God, the ways that we're running from you. Maybe the ways that you're trying to grab our attention to help us see that we've drifted, God. I think some of us have drifted and we don't even recognize it. We don't even understand it. We've become so conformed to this world that we don't realize the depth of our own sin. But my prayer today, God, is that we'd recognize that sin cost you your life. God, let us not grieve your Holy Spirit. God, let us not quench your Holy Spirit in our lives, but let us walk worthy so that we can bring glory and honor to you in all that we say and do. And God, for those today that don't know that hope, that don't understand that hope, I pray that they would accept your grace today and give their life to Christ and walk worthy. Lord, we love you, we praise you, and we thank you. In your name we pray, amen.